Dear viewers, welcome to Tritya Matra. My guest for tonight, Tritya Matra, is Ambassador Masha Barnicat, who is uh, going to leave us very soon. Uh, Masha Stephens Bloom Barnicat became the U.S. Ambassador to Bangladesh on February 2015, a career member of the Senior Foreign Service, class of Minister Counselor. She previously served as Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, in the Bureau of Human Resources at the U.S. Department of State. Uh, as a former Chief of Mission and two-time Deputy Chief of Mission, Ms. Barnicat has demonstrated her skill and management ability at a wide variety of multi-agency posts. Her previous assignments in Washington and in South Asia dealing with that region also have given her an excellent preparation to serve with distinction in Bangladesh. Ms. Barnicat was ambassador to Senegal and Guinea-Bissau. She is the recipient of numerous Department of State Award awards, including five senior foreign service performance awards, two superior honor awards, uh, four meritorious honor awards, and one group meritorious honor awards. Ambassador, nice to see you. It's great to be back at Channel I. Thank you. Can we start? Yes. Uh, Madam Ambassador, how would you describe the relationship between Bangladesh and the United States at this moment when you are about to end your assignment here? Uh, there is a frustrating perception in Bangladesh. Uh, I hope you know that uh, the U.S. is not seeing Bangladesh with its own eyes, but seeing through the eyes of India. I'm so glad you started with that question because I can't emphasize enough that um, the relationship between the United States and Bangladesh is built on mutual values, on a shared history, uh, as well as shared origins, and that it is the kind of relationship we prefer to call a partnership because there's really a two-way exchange of ideas, of, of, of investments, of, of every activity that you can think of that two peoples do together. Um, the United States does not outsource its foreign policy. And so um, while- That sounds our, good. <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> and, and, and it has a virtue of being true. Yeah. Um, I think people, are, get confused because we have at the same period of time also strengthened our relationship with India. Um, but you know, make no mistake about it, we are three sovereign countries and the way we relate to one another is based on our own national interests but also a shared interest for a stable and prosperous South Asia. Uh, there is also a perception of political uneasy between these two countries, uh, I mean, U.S. and Bangladesh, mm -hmm. uh, especially between the governments for the last couple of years. Uh, if I ask you to name one irritant which adversely affects our relationship, uh, can you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I wouldn't characterize uh, our relationship as, as being one uh, of, of irritants. I think that, you know, if you think of the, your best friends in life, um, there are probably people with whom you've had disagreements over time. Yeah, right. Why? Because your relationship is so close that you can do that. And I think in the case of Bangladesh and the United States, there are times when we each expressed concerns to the other that may make us uneasy, but um, it is not what I would call an irritant. Irritants are things I think of that keep two peoples from, from being uh, working together, mm -hmm. being committed to the relationship. And I don't think we have any of those uh, issues. There are issues on which we're working and we express our, uh, our opinions, each of us, and we work towards uh, resolution. Um, and I can think of any number of issues where that's the case. Um, but again, the commitment is to make progress to the point where that issue is no longer an issue. Uh, so how is the U.S. government contributing to Bangladesh's socio-economic and political development process? Yes. Well, we are really proud, again, to have been Bangladesh's partner well before uh, Bangladesh became a country. I mean, mm -hmm. we, we've been working together even uh, before 1971. But we have been so proud to be your partners along this journey. Bangladesh remains the single largest recipient of development assistance from the United States, uh, not counting Afghanistan and Pakistan. They are complete uh, exceptions in, uh, in uh, many ways. Um, but well beyond that, um, our commercial partnership has grown over the years. And the most recent and most spectacular example of that is the launching of the Bangabandhu One yeah. satellite on you know, a first time ever launch of a SpaceX 
rocket, the Falcon 9. Um, and both uh, enterprises were completely successful. Um, and so uh, we, we don't, we, yes, uh, there, are, there are the traditional fields of health and education and, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, strengthening democracy. And we're working in all of those fields and more. <clears throat> but we also have these, these uh, very, very modern, very commercially related uh, development stories, if you will, as well. Uh, Madam Ambassador, you know uh, Bangladesh is currently faced with some daunting challenges um, in coping with almost a million migrants uh, who were forced out by the neighboring state of Myanmar. Uh, internal governance deficit to deal with transitional crimes, especially in flux of drugs, money laundering, and uh, corruption in financial sector. How can Bangladesh overcome these challenges? Uh, could you suggest some short or long-term measures? Right. Uh, let me save the Rohingya crisis for last, if I can. Every other issue you mentioned is improved when governments work together. You mm -hmm. know, you can lump all of them under the category of transnational crimes. And we in the United States have spent a long time fighting drugs bilaterally. We just fought trying to prevent drugs from coming across our border. It's not enough. In addition to reducing the demand for drugs, which is a domestic mm -hmm. policy, we know that transnational criminals share resources. So, you know, the person who facilitates money laundering is also helping to traffic drugs and or wildlife and or people. And so when you tackle one of those issues, you are by definition weakening the others as well. What's the biggest advantage those criminals have over us? They ignore borders and they ignore laws. Um, we, as nation states who are bound to the rule of law, have in the past been hindered to some extent or had our borders and our laws work against us. And I think the growing network of countries that are cooperating together help defeat that, those transnational criminals. For example, Bangladesh recently became, I believe, the 51st country to sign on to sharing a data place called Codex. Mm -hmm. Codex um, is a keeper of uh, DNA information, which is increasingly uh, vital to solving crimes and or proving guilt uh, in a court of law. And so Bangladesh ha has a world-class DNA lab, and now it is connected to the information. Why? Because, um, as we've seen, um, people who commit terrorist acts or just criminal acts will cross borders to do that. So, so now, you know, by putting that data into the system, Bangladesh can know more. On the Rohingya, mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, it is absolutely clear that this was a crisis not of Bangladesh's making. You know, there was no war that took place. There was no uh, a change in, a, in an agricultural policy or, or, or some such that caused the Rohingya to flee across the border the way they did. They fled because of the atrocities being perpetrated on them, the inexplicable and inexcusable atrocities in Burma. Um, I some people suggest it's genocide. Some people su 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 suggest genocide. Um, we in, in uh, the Department of State mm -hmm. made a finding very early on, in fact, the most rapid yeah. I can remember of ethnic cleansing. It's clear that a certain ethnic group in, in, uh, in, in, in Burma, the Rohingya, were targeted for moving them out and destroying all that they left behind, including their, their uh, property. Um, I think uh, the resolution of that issue is, is, is multiple. One, there's an immediate crisis of how do you house and feed and keep um, healthy, a group of people living in um, a very, very congested area, um, which exacerbate all of those problems. Uh, and uh, I think Bangladesh has not only opened its borders to people who are in trouble, but they've also opened their borders to the international community and formed an unprecedented response to an unprecedented problem. And I can't emphasize that enough. I love to make this image put this image in people's minds. People were running, especially from the Burmese military, men in uniform who were committing atrocities. Yeah. When they got to Bangladesh, who was part of the service provider community, um, keeping them safe, but also 
handing them identity cards and, and in other ways helping them restore the dignity and the well-being that they had just lost, the Bangladesh army um, and the police. Uh, and I think it speaks volumes of the nature of governance here, the nature of the institutions here, and also Bangladesh's commitment to help people just as others helped Bangladesh in 1971 in particular. And I love that, that reference, you know, um, I know that people are, are tiring of hearing us talk about the generosity of the Bangladeshi people and the Bangladesh government. Trust me, no one underestimates, or let me put that positively, mm -hmm. everyone is fully aware of what this crisis is costing Bangladesh in every sense. And we are grateful for the fact that the Bangladeshi um, government and people are willing to provide this. But that also makes us committed in the United States and many of your other uh, friends to helping resolve this crisis, to making the conditions suitable so that they can go home again. And that they can go home in safety, so there's no need to flee again, yeah. so they can go home with dignity, and so they can go home under, un, under the conditions that will allow them to sustain a life there. As you are well aware that Bangladesh's vulnerabilities are arising from extremely high dependence on single export of garments in global trade. What is your prediction about uh, the future prospects of Bangladesh uh, exports? Yes. Well, first and foremost, um, building on your strength, mm -hmm. I think as Bangladesh becomes more prosperous, um, it will, like other countries, move up the value chain of, of, of uh, RMG. Um, there will be some people who continue to make t-shirts, but there will be many more uh, manufacturers producing the suits that you and I yeah. wear, and the shoes as a tremendous talent um, and good quality leather goods available here. But beyond that- In fact, that, we're the brand makers. Yes. Brand makers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But beyond that, yeah. There are so many other industries ripe. Look at pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. um, Bangladesh is now exporting to the American market. Uh, leaders in the industry tell me we are the toughest market to enter mm -hmm. because of our regulations, but there are now um, an increasing number of pharmaceuticals made here in Bangladesh being, uh, being bought and, and, and healing people in, in, in my country. I think the IT sector is just beginning to take off really. Beyond back-end services, there are companies here that are providing Internet of Things development, technology development for countries like Japan. So what does mm -hmm. that tell you about the potential mm -hmm. of that sector? Similarly, agro-business, um, uh, 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 um, uh, shipbuilding um, are, are two other industries that come to mind that are just waiting for the kinds of investment to, to really take off here. Uh, Bangladesh's increase in population and rampant urbanization uh, may create huge dislocations and will necessitate uh, changes in infrastructure and uh, city planning for physical safety and lesser conflict in society. The internal governance problems seem uh, not easy to overcome. Uh, the reform measures in line with recommendations of the donor countries and regulatory oversight uh, are slow and ineffective so far. How do you think uh, the appropriate reforms uh, could be taken to sustain further growth and uh, meaningful economic transformations? Right. I think, you know, part of the, the secret lies in, um, in a more open economy. Um, for one, no economy that expects to continue to grow can do so without exporting. Bangladesh has the second, is the second largest producer of RMG in the world, um, but that industry will from time to time be subject to shocks. So building a more diverse export po portfolio is really key. How, how do you do that? You must attract foreign direct investment. And there, unfortunately, you compete with the rest of the world. So the ease of doing business is really important. You don't have to have the best ease of doing business, but you need to be demonstrating to businesses that each year it gets, it's getting easier to do business here. And I know that there are some, uh, BIDA, for example, the Bangladesh Investment and Development Agency and others are working on how to reduce the number of steps it takes. It takes 41 steps, I think, right now to establish a business. You've got to get that, you yeah. know, um, to, be, to be less cumbersome. Other things like infrastructure are well in development. The Honorable Prime Minister has put such an emphasis on 
increasing reliable power generation here on roads. Um, there's further, I know there's work being, uh, being planned for the airport, um, for the port. You want to make sure that your turnaround times are, are quick and easy, um, or quicker and easier. Um, I think in addition to that, um, there, um, uh, the issue of, of corruption, which is a big part of ease of doing business, um, I think you want to attract the type of investors here where you know every dollar or every, um, every franc or every you know, euro is going into the product itself, going into the project itself. Um, otherwise, the Bangladeshi people um, are, 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 are being denied mm -hmm. the full benefit, the full mm -hmm. impact of, of that project or that, that purchase. Um, and so I think all of these uh, issues can help um, strengthen. The other thing I think is really important is um, developing your other cities in Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. I, I've never lived anywhere where one city is so predominant. I mean, I know that Bangladesh isn't the only country, but mm -hmm. when I hear discussions about um, opening up transit agreements between Bangladesh and India, I think, what an advantage for India you know, with the right rules and regulations in place, you're in the middle mm -hmm. of Eastern India. Mm -hmm. um, goods and services that pass through here um, offer opportunities to build up all the cities and towns along those routes who have to, who should be able, and should be in a position to provide services to the truckers or in fact become destinations for the goods that they haul themselves. Um, the subway being built here will allow people to live further outside of Dhaka and still commute here during the day. Same, same for roads. I think part of reducing the tensions that you referred mm -hmm. to is um, having multiple nodes in the country where, where people can live and, and prosper. Ambassador, uh, Bangladesh's counter-terrorism efforts have shown success. Uh, I hope you, uh, you do agree with me. Uh, do you think this success could be relentless and robust in the face of political uncertainties and social movements and conflicts? Um, I think one is, a is, is sort of a, both the result and a driver of the other. Mm -hmm. um, I think when, when, you, when you look at political uncertainty, you are defining a democracy. Uh, this is the hardest way to govern, um, uh, but it's the best way to govern. And so how you accommodate all those conflicting interests mm -hmm. should result, if you've got strong institutions and you've got strong leaders and you've got a society where everyone can contribute ideas and be heard, that uncertainty can be resolved into a way forward that's, that serves everyone and that moves, moves the country forward. You know, I think in the same way, I mean, I, I've been congratulating Bangladesh for having students who cared enough about an issue that they came out and actually demonstrated yeah. how to make it better. And I think at its core, um, you have to admire a country who are raising children who are that civic-minded and who want to be part of the solution rather than just tearing it down. I was part of the <laughs> 60s generation, you know, and in those days we used to talk about just tearing the government down. Um, that's not the answer. The answer is how to make government responsive to, to the things that you want to make the country better. And I think Bangladesh is fortunate to have, to be raising those <laughs> kinds of citizens here. Yeah. Uh, Bangladesh, as you know, is highly prone to climate change and uh, suffers from inability to deal with destructions and human sufferings against uh, disasters, especially flood and earthquakes. Uh, do you think this nation can sustain its commendable economic growth in the face of such calamities? Yeah. Um, in fact, you are positioned in that, that part of the world that is more prone to disasters mm -hmm. than any other on the planet. Um, which is a huge disadvantage, but I suspect it has helped make Bangladeshis as resilient to people as you are. Um, I can tell you this, our US Agency for International Development, um, our Defense Department, uh, our Centers for Disease Control have wonderful partners in your government and in civil society here working on ways to think through how to address and plan for those uh, disasters. Um, we were proud suppliers of, 
of um, cyclone shelters mm -hmm. um, that now are widely used. Now, um, we may have built the shelters, but it was your government that taught people, well, that set up a, an, an emergency alert system, taught people what it meant and what to do in response to that. Um, again, talking about the partnership. Um, in the same way, I think earthquakes are far harder to predict uh, and to prepare for, but I think you know more and more builders here in Dhaka are building their buildings to r more rigorous earthquake standards. Um, I think in any disaster, how well you've managed, um, how well you've planned for that disaster will have a great effect on how you survive that, that disaster. And I have to give um, particular kudos to the head of Bangladesh's Fire Service and Civil Defense Corps. Um, he is a man I know who thinks constantly about mm -hmm. these, who we interact with a lot. And I think knowing there's a problem, recognizing that, that this will be an ongoing challenge, and then preparing for it will help you minimize um, the damage, help you recover from the damage you do uh, sustain, so that you can, you can get back to doing what you do best, and that is develop. Ambassador, do you think, despite Bangladesh's success in improving its status from least developed uh, country to middle income or uh, developing country, uh, providing inequality and deprivation uh, pose serious threats to human uh, security? How would the U.S. help in improving the situation? Yes. You know, um, equity and growth is a serious challenge mm -hmm. everywhere around the globe. Um, I come from a country that, like Bangladesh, that fully embraces the ability of individuals to do as, as well as they can. And I, I wouldn't want to see that system change. Um, I do think part of helping um, ensure that growth is more equitable um, lies in part in the role that those who are the most privileged in our societies can play. I see corporate social responsibility, well, we are sitting in an organization that takes CSR very seriously. Um, I'm very proud of the work that Chevron does in that regard and, and others. Um, good companies understand that they're not just doing this because it's the right thing to do, which should be enough, but that you are also creating more consumers, more, um, more customers, more uh, you know, a, a stronger society in which your enterprise can also thrive. And so I think that that's a real key. But I also think that it, government has to be very careful in promoting policies and in, in, in promoting programs to make sure that the, that the growth that those programs are being designed to provoke mm -hmm. are, um, can be as equitable as possible. Otherwise, I, I agree entirely. I believe your, your premise is, and I think it's the right one, deprivation alone doesn't cause revolution. Deprivation alone doesn't cause people to become radicalized. But they, it, it is an element in, in uh, instability, an important one, especially today in a world that is so interconnected. Um, your poorest villager with a smartphone can see just what life looks like in Bollywood or in you know, Central Park, uh, to Central Park's most expensive apartments. Um, not everyone wants to or aspires to be as rich as they can be, but nobody should be poor, nobody should suffer from disease, nobody should not have the opportunity to get the education that will allow them not only to earn uh, an honest wage for themselves, but pay taxes on those wages and, and, and contribute to their country's uh, viability as well. You were talking about young people, and you know well, one of the reasons the United States uh, is an attraction for young people uh, all over the world uh, is its college, colleges and universities. Do many Bangladeshi students uh, study in the United States? Uh, do many American students tend to undertake a study uh, abroad or service projects in Bangladesh? Mm. Ziller, I am so proud of the fact that um, as I leave Bangladesh, there are more Bangladeshi students studying in the U.S. than ever before. Mm -hmm. You are among the top 25 countries in the world sending uh, students to university level educations in the U.S. And you are among the top nine countries in the world sending graduate students to the U.S., which tells me your students are very smart. Mm -hmm. They're getting a good basic undergraduate education, many of them here in Bangladesh. 
and then going to the more admittedly expensive uh, U.S. schools for their specialized um, training. Um, education builds bridges like no other. I'm sorry to say I don't have the figures for how many Americans are coming here, but we see increased involvement, not just in students being here, but people coming here to do research projects, um, you know, universities in Bangladesh and the US reaching out to each other directly without any government involvement mm -hmm. to share programs and professors and to send students in, in two-way exchanges. Um, I expect that will only increase in the future and that with it will come an increased under, an even more increased understanding. Um, the other thing I would say is that I've met my favorite moments here, and I, there's so many, but my favorite moments are always with your young people, um, young students, young you know, business people just starting out. There is so much energy and they're so smart. And I've met so many people you know, someone accused me of um, the United States, uh, accused the United States of brain drain. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, we're only borrowing your brains. I have met people who have come back right after university study, people who have spent a year or two after their studies working and then coming back, people who come back mid-career. I've met people who have come back at the end of their careers in the United States, starting over again by building an RMG factory or mm -hmm. you know, volunteering in their villages and setting up programs. It's extraordinary. I think people come back for two reasons, primarily. One is Bangladesh captures you. And I think e even for those of us who weren't born here, once we've been here, we have to come back. We're compelled to come back. But I think the other reason is because of the opportunities that are present here in Bangladesh. And I think young people know that better than any of us. And they're in the best position to take advantage of those opportunities. So I'm really proud to see how many people have studied in the US, but come back here to, to, to build their, their own country. Ambassador, why is Bangladesh of strategic interest to the United States? Mm. Well, take a look at the globe, you know. Um, you are in an amazing neighborhood. In some ways, it is pivotal to the rest of the world, you know. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh is part of the Indo-Pacific region, sits in that part of the world with more than half of the world's largest economies, and more than half of the world's population. Whatever happens here matters to the rest of us, by definition. Bangladesh is the country that bridges East Asia and South Asia, and again, you know, the most vibrant part of the globe in so many ways right now. And there you are at the crossroads. Um, the third reason, I think, is also uh, inherent in Bangladesh itself. You are the eighth largest country in the world. Yeah. You are the third largest Muslim majority country in the world. At a time, sadly, in the West, where people too often conflate Islam with negative things that mm -hmm. happen in the world, terrorism and what else, Bangladesh is a screaming example of exactly what Islam is, how, you know, exactly what a developing country that is serious about its own development looks like and acts like. You are this amazing example for a the moderate world. Moderate Muslim country, you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah. Moderate and tolerant. And tolerant. You know, that, that, that you celebrate a vast array of, of religious holidays and know that it doesn't diminish you as a uh, as, as a Muslim is is a lesson many other countries can learn. Thank um, you. Uh, many people think that U.S. policy in South Asia is at, uh, is in uh, disarray. Bangladesh is no exception, despite a number of strategic partnership agreements. What is your view on the future of U.S. Bangladesh relations uh, relationship vis a vis a U.S. Uh, regional position? Mm. I would say that ha having worked in and on South Asian affairs for almost 37 years now, the length of my career, I've never seen a more deliberate foreign policy of the United States towards uh, South Asia. And it is individualized. Again, um, we recognize that each of the countries of South Asia and Central Asia mm -hmm. are in very different places economically, politically, uh, that they all you know, have a role, excuse me, to contributing um, uh, in the region's stability and prosperity. And the Indo-Pacific strategy, which is not 
brand new. The idea has been around for a couple of years, predating the, our current U.S. Mm -hmm. administration. But what is different is our, this administration has taken that policy and made it central. Again, those two vast regions of the world in terms of population and ge geography fitting together, working together to do what? To promote free navigation, to, pr to promote um, uh, equally cherished values, and to promote stability. And, and the three go together very purposefully. Uh, and so I think our, our, our policy or our actions will be driven in no small part by that new strategy. And I expect that our relationship is going to continue, continue to strengthen. Uh, Ambassador, U.S. role in the Bangladesh liberation uh, world is, is still controversial. Uh, do you have any explanation? You know, the best explanation I've heard mm -hmm. um, is one that your uh, honorable foreign minister talks about, who happened to be in the United States, mm -hmm. in New York, when, in uh, when... Exactly. And like so many other Bangladeshis, suddenly had to decide. Um, and I know he did not hesitate in his decision. But he spent the rest of his time in the U.S. educating American citizens about what was going on here, asking for support, raising funds. And so he talks about the other part of the story. So yes, there, it's indisputable, though now that all the, the classified papers from mm -hmm. both the U.S. and India, as well as Bangladesh, are, are coming out. Um, you can see exactly what was driving our policymakers' decisions at the time, mm -hmm. and it was the opening to China. Um, but the American people, yeah. uh, many parts of the American Congress, most notably Senator Edward Kennedy, Kennedy. Um, were for the Bangladeshi people. I can tell you, I was a, an 18-year-old in 1971, and I remember reading about and hearing about what was going on here. and you know, demonstrating in support of Bangladesh and donating money for, in support of Bangladesh made this 18-year-old feel like she could change the course of history a half a world away. And I can't tell you how empowering that was as an 18-year-old who wasn't dreaming of being a diplomat at the time, by the way. Um, but I would say that uh, people who only consider what our official government policy was at the time are missing the essence of how most Americans felt about the liberation war. And I think the fact that we recognized the newly independent Bangladesh a few, four short months later, mm -hmm. uh, and our aid program at the time was uh, huge. It was $200 million, but in, in terms of 1972 dollars, that was a substantial amount of money, and represented the investment we were making in the newly independent Bangladesh to help not only heal the scars of war, but the scars of the cyclone that had devastated this country only a few short years before. Here is another point. Do you have any idea of the U.S. role during, uh, before and after the assassination of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman? What would you say to me? You know, any time a world leader or, or government officials are assassinated, that is a brutal and inexcusable interruption in history. Um, in democracies, we have many ways of changing our governments yeah. and our government's policies. And so um, my government was shocked at the time that not only the, the founder of a, of a nation was killed, um, but that military rule resulted, and, and, a, and, a, and a chaotic period resulted. Chaos isn't good for anyone. Mm -hmm. um, anyone who argues that um, a, a country wants to destabilize another country has to stop and ask themselves, exactly in whose interest would that be, you know? In whose interest would it be right now for Bangladesh to be unstable? We know ISIS and Al Qaeda would would uh, would would like that outcome. They've actively declared that they're working towards that outcome, but it's the same outcome they want for the United States, right? Mm -hmm. They want to destabilize the U.S., but it's not in anyone's interest, you know. Even the countries and Bangabandhu had a a wonderful philosophy that he that he left you with, 
be a friend to all and have malice towards none. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, uh, as you look around the globe, I, I can't think of a country with whom you have violated that, that tenet. You have held fast to his wisdom. What would you say have been, uh, has been your uh, most fulfilling experience in Bangladesh as a U.S. ambassador? My most fulfilling experience. Fulfilling. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, that's hard. I've had so many moments where I have felt um, fulfilled. I guess I would, uh, I can think of one um, sort of set of experiences that I would put above the other. You know, I've been really honored to serve here in Bangladesh with more women heads of mission and heads of UN agencies than at any other time in my career. I, I don't know if it's the inspiration of your prime minister, if it's the inspiration of of uh, how many women hold leadership positions here, um, but we've worked together with our male counterparts, mm -hmm. but we've worked together to not only highlight issues that are of particular importance to women and children, but also to um, serve as role models. You know, if you, if you see someone doing what, if there, are, if there are children in your audience who wanna be a news broadcaster, they can see you and they take you as a role model. So we, we have felt very strongly that way. The United States sponsors, uh, so my most mm -hmm. fulfilling moments are, for three years in a row, an unprecedented three years in a row, um, the United States sponsored uh, women, or nominated women to the Department of State for the, our International Women of Courage Awards. And three years in a row we yeah. won. Um, and I think each of them had very different stories. The first was a journalist, who was beaten severely, um, uh, uh, in, in part just for being a woman, out on the streets doing a non-traditional job. Um, the second is a, a real champion of human rights. And the third, and we had to do some research about this, um, our third winner was not a woman, she was a girl. Um, and uh, she was nominated because she fought back against child marriage with the help of male uh, relatives and the court system and the police, and she won, and she's a university student today. And I think in terms of fulfilling uh, experiences, <clears throat> it was not just winning that award uh, um, uh, three years in a row, but the fact that we got to highlight the stories of three women who are making such a difference in this in this country's future. Ambassador, you have said many times that a democracy is in Bangladesh's DNA. Do you think Bangladesh is able to deliver democracy? Absolutely. Um, here, here's the thing about it, you mm -hmm. know, I, I mentioned this earlier, I think it was Winston Churchill said it's the worst form of government except all the others. Democracy is hard, it's difficult. Um, from election to election, making sure that those elections are, are are contested fairly, um, but much more importantly, building the institutions. We are strong when we have a strong judiciary, a strong legislature, a strong executive, and then outside of government, we have a strong media mm. that keeps all of us honest by casting a critical eye and holding us accountable for our words and our actions. Um, Bangladesh has all the elements of that because quite frankly, of your origin story, which didn't begin in 1971. You know, students back in 1952 recognized that having another language imposed on this country, of all the countries in the world that has a language that is so steeped in tradition and has such a rich history and culture, um, but students stood up and said no, at, at the cost of their lives for a number of them. Um, that tells me democracy is in your DNA. People react to injustice here, you know. Um, people make demands on their, on their government. Because we are citizens of democracies, we are living with governments that are imperfect. And they're imperfect because humans are imperfect. Mm -hmm. um, but the extent to which we can keep our governments responding to us, because in a democracy, we're the bosses, right? We're the, we're the rulers. We choose to elect representatives to do the day-to-day -day work of government, um, but we are the ones who are ultimately responsible and, and hold them accountable. And I think 
if you have that, if you have that basic drive, then you know, d does your democracy look perfect or function perfectly? No, it is definitely a, a, you know, a, a, a work in, in progress. But I see that work in progress. And again, you've only had 47 short years of it so far, yeah. um, with mixed results by anyone's measure. But why does Bangladesh keep coming back to democracy? It's in your DNA. Uh, many observers feel that despite Bangladesh's considerable growth, political stability and social harmony remain unaddressed and much will depend on national reconciliation and compromise of political forces. They feel that political disunity and uncertainty in peaceful transfer of power loom large in the coming months. Uh, are you optimistic about Bangladesh's successfully democratic transition this time uh, with participation of all parties and groups who are coming, uh, competing for power? Mm. Um, you, you, you raise a particularly interesting point mm -hmm. that, that I would start with, and that is the cost of losing. Um, and I, I've seen this in any number of countries around the world. If losing an election means you lose everything, you know, your, your, your access to business, your access to decision makers, your home, maybe your family, your freedom, uh, that's too high a price to pay for losing. Losing should mean that you go back to doing something else, be it you know, an opposition politician, be it a banker, be it a lawyer, be it a doctor, whatever. Um, uh, that should be the price of losing, that you still have a say in government, you just don't have the majority say anymore. Um, and I think that is, uh, that is a tradition that is still building in this country. Um, will Bangladesh have successful elections this time. Again, I think that's up to its citizens as well as the government, you know. Will people go to vote? Will they, you know, not be intimidated? Because there are stories of intimidation yeah. here. Will people demand accountability if they find that their ballot has already been cast? They have a mechanism to do that, to complain um, to the election commission um, afterwards. Do they, um, will they uh, will all the citizens exercise their, their ability? The worst thing we can do as citizens of a democracy is not show up, is not, is not make demands of our, of our elected officials. Um, I hope, and we've been working towards, uh, as well as, as, as others have, of um, trying to ensure that this election season is as violence-free as possible. I think, again, there's a long history of violence associated with, with elections, and I think the extent to which, and we saw a remarkable lack of, of overt violence during the five municipal elections this time, mm -hmm. which I've talked about and we were really welcomed, um, but we, we would also want to see that um, there's less covert violence as well, or less you know, less of the intimidation and, and other factors, and that people get to come out. I think to the extent that people feel they've had the chance to express themselves and be heard, um, you avoid, you not only avoid violence, but you keep a citizen or an employee engaged in the process. My bosses haven't told me yes every time I've come to them with, a, with an idea or resolved my complaints in the way I would have wanted them to every time I brought one. But if I felt I got a fair hearing, if I felt I got a fair explanation to why something couldn't be done, then I walked away satisfied. And I think, our, I think we, we should demand that of our governments to be heard, but then to recognize that there's a whole country and any number of competing interests that need to be accommodated in the governance process. How did you find Bangladesh during your period as an ambassador, US ambassador here in Bangladesh? Mm -hmm. uh, what attracts you most? Yes, well I have to say, again, it has to be the people. You know, um, I, I say all the time that uh, I wasn't welcomed here as an honored guest. And what's wrong with that? I mean, being an honored guest is, is amazing, right? I, I felt from the beginning like I was being welcomed as a family member coming home. Uh, and you, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, and I think uh, for me, the fact that I've been able to go everywhere, talk to everyone, 
um, interact with people. Uh, one of my favorite, I, I have failed to learn Bangla, that is you know, my confession on your show, but, um, but I have some favorite Bangla words, and one of them is Adda. Adda. <laughs> you know? Brishti. Mishti and Brishti. Brishti. Yes, Brishti. absolutely. Yeah. Um, but I love this notion of just hanging out and talking and exchanging views. And, and I've always appreciated that people not only wanted to hear what I liked about Bangladesh, but what I didn't like about Bangladesh. They wanted to have a full conversation, an honest conversation. Um, and for me, that has been very fulfilling. A diplomat can't be very successful if they cannot talk to people. Part of that is on us, right? Mm -hmm, we have mm -hmm. to have the ability to talk to people. But then we also have to be in an environment where people are free to, to talk back to us. And um, I've had the most amazing conversations. Everyone's been a teacher in, in, you know, in, in, in many ways. Um, and I've never walked away from a conversation not feeling energized. Would you like to come here again? Absolutely. No, no. I not only would like to come here again, I will be coming here again. Absolutely. Four of my predecessors mm -hmm. uh, visited Bangladesh while I was here. Um, and so I know I'll come back. I, I want to see how things progress. And I, and I use that word purposely. I know that they will progress. I, I've studied your history, so I, I know your trajectory. And I will very much be back um, to, to see for myself and I'll be tracking from afar via um, YouTube and other mechanisms in the meantime. Yeah. Do you have any dissatisfactions, any hard feelings? Uh, it, 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 it's a very personal one, um, and, and it's mostly on me, but um, your food is way too good, and I've gained way too much weight since I've been here. <laughs> And I, and I would say, I mean, it, it isn't a dissatisfaction. Again, I could always <laughs> say no, but I didn't. Um, but uh, I've learned but here that food it is... It looks fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you should see that wardrobe of clothes that don't fit anymore. But, I, 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 uh, but food is a part of everything. Mm -hmm. And you cannot say no. Um, uh, th that's a very minor complaint, though, a very minor one. People always ask me about the traffic, and while it's frustrating to get someplace yeah. too, too late and all, people always understand, uh, and I've, I've, I've learned to make friends with my iPad, so I get a lot of work done uh, as I'm sitting in traffic. Um, but uh, This is the third visit at Channel I, uh, and we are entering 20 years. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, yeah, well, you know, again, I am a big fan of the work that Channel I has done. I understand that people receive more information through television now than any other means. And, uh, and I've been in villages where there's one television that everybody shares. Um, what I've really appreciated about Channel I is that you feel a deep responsibility to your viewership, particularly your rural viewership, and that you provide programming that they can use that provides, Im you provide information that brings new technology uh, in a way that they might not have ever gotten or they might not have gotten for years, um, that your, your CSR underscores the information you provide and that you are also the sponsors of many programs um, that, that help people. And you've been a tremendous partner for us, USAID in particular, um, we're very proud of the work we've done in agriculture and health and, and the environment. Yeah. Um, you asked early about the environment. I mean, the things that Bangladeshis are learning to do today um, because climate change and its effects have hit you first will teach the rest of us how to cope with the changes we cannot forestall. And so... Um, I've been very grateful that you have been our partner for a long time, or more accurately, we've been your partner for a long time. Any, any sentence in Bengali on Channel I? <laughs> 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 yes. Kote prane mishe, amra akhon pishe. Uh, any final words for the viewers or Bangladeshi citizens? Um, I, I guess I would say this, you know, um, this is a very, very special part of the world. And I think 
um, I would urge Bangladeshis to figure out ways to tell your story to the rest of the world. Too many people learn about Bangladesh because they're coming here as part of a trip to another part of the world or you know, they, they come here because they're related to somebody who's here for, for a time. And I, I, haven't met a, I haven't seen a visitor yet who isn't amazed when they get here. They were picturing Bangladesh in 1971. Your origin story is a powerful one, um, but it, it in some ways is overshadowing Bangladesh of today. And I think um, you need to tell the world in, a, in an age where we are flooded by information, you need to tell the world. I've seen wonderful promotional videos done here. You need to put them on American television, put them on television in Europe. Um, we're already your, your greatest trading partners, but you know, there's so much more that we can be doing here that the diaspora can be doing yeah. here. Um, but people need to see where the opportunities are um, so, so that they can, uh, they can come and, and participate. Because they will come if they know, um, but they'll stay because of, of the opportunities there are. Ambassador Marsha Banikert, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Our love and best wishes for you. you. Uh, we were here tonight to enjoy one last evening together with Her Excellency Marsha Barniket. Uh, we wish all the best for her, for her future life. Uh, thank you, viewers. Thank you for joining us.